Right, let's stay with COVID and pick up first on a story that we ran last night. Uh, that's the story about the HIV positive woman who remained COVID-19 positive for over 200 days. Professor Tula de Rivera of the KZN Research Innovation and Sequencing Platform, CRISP, described this to us as the human body almost becoming a factory for COVID variants. As that virus circulated through her system, it went through something like 30 uh, mutations in that virus. Well, let's discuss this now and what it means. Uh, someone who's not only researched HIV AIDS for decades, but also for the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic, headed up the Ministerial Advisory Committee on the Coronavirus. Of course, it's Professor Salim Abdul Karim. He's director of CAPRISA. That's the Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa. He is also now a member of the World Health Organization's Science Panel. Prof, thank you so much for joining us this Friday night. This this case about COVID-19 remaining in the system of a woman who was immunocompromised for nearly eight months is quite startling. Is it typical uh, or is it an unusual case? Because surely that's critical. Good evening, Sally, and good evening to all the viewers. We have now had two very clear reports, both published in the New England Journal of Medicine, of patients who have uh, are severely immunocompromised. One was a cancer patient, and the other was a patient who was on immunosuppressive therapy. And we've seen in both those patients how the virus continues to replicate and remain live over a long period of months. And during that, we see multiple mutations occurring. And this new case that has just been described in a preprint that has been put up uh, in research being done by Professor Dolivera and Professor Sigal, they have shown that what we had seen previously in other immunocompromised patients is also something we are seeing in severely immunocompromised patients with HIV. And as you pointed out, what we have seen is exactly the same thing, that the virus remains viable and replicating in an individual for a long period of several months, and during that time acquired several mutations. So it looks like the source of, the, of being immunocompromised is less important, but being immunocompromised, and in this patient, her CD4 count was 20. Just think about that, because a normal CD4 count is over a thousand. So this is somebody who was really severely immunocompromised. So is this unusual behavior for a virus? I'm thinking of, of someone who's got very low immunity. Could it be that they pick up the flu virus and just can't shake it for months? Is it typical for a virus to do this? So no, it is not typical for viruses to do this. What we have seen is that even in individuals who are immunocompromised, they develop some kind of immunity. But what we have seen now in patients who have, uh, who are quite severely immunocompromised, others have very low CD4 counts and so on, there's three things we are seeing. One is that the virus replicates, and we've already described that. The second is that the individual, the patient, does not develop antibodies or T-cell responses. So in other words, there is no immune response to clear the virus. The third is that the moment this patient went on to effective treatment, and when that effective treatment reduced her viral load, her immunity came back. As soon as her immunity came back, she cleared the COVID. So it's that, that state of being immunocompromised that puts patients in this situation in COVID. When we look at, for example, in other viruses, we don't see this kind of long infection with mutations, but we do see more severe disease. We see that in measles, for example. Mm. So I just have to ask how concerned you are about this, because uh, on the one hand, it could be, well, this is interesting. It's quite unique. It doesn't happen very often. And it's really interesting to see what COVID-19 uh, does in the system of a, someone with a, a low immunity when it's given half the chance. Or could this be a potential game changer opening up a really worrying new front 
not only for COVID-19, but also for people with HIV? It's very worrying. And I have to say, not unexpected. We have always understood that individuals who are immunocompromised, and we expected that that would occur in patients who had HIV infection, that we may see an unusual course of disease. So that's not, it's not an unexpected situation. That we now have evidence for it, empiric evidence, is what is deeply concerning. But I tell you what concerned me most. In this particular individual, as the virus replicated in her body, she acquired three key mutations. A mutation, the first mutation that occurred in day six was in position 484. The second mutation occurred, I think, around day 71, was the mutation at position 417. And then right towards the end, she developed a mutation in position 501. Now, those three mutations, they are the three mutations that we have in the receptor binding domain of the uh, 501YV2 variant that we described in South Africa back in December last year. So this patient is showing us that actually that variant could very well have come from an HIV positive patient or can be generated in that sequence in a person who is severely immunocompromised. And that tells us we have to expect more variants. That is very troubling news indeed. It is 40 years, I understand, since the first case of HIV AIDS was reported. This is an area of extreme specialization for you and Caprisa. Um, what are your reflections on where we are as a nation in terms of coping and managing with HIV? The obvious question is, uh, are we close to a vaccine? Um, but, but just generally and globally, given that we're in the middle of a pandemic, I've asked you a very long question, <laughs> which is probably something that could take hours to answer. Uh, but I just, I suppose, want your reflections on HIV 40 years in, as we're in the middle of another pandemic. Sure, Sally. You know, Kuresh uh, and I have already written a book on HIV. It's about uh, uh, 400 odd pages, so you can imagine that there's no short answer to this question. <laughs> yeah. But let me just say that when I think back, I was a young medical student when I read this uh, report in the MMWR, which is the publication of the US CDC. It was a very short, simple report. Five cases of an unusual pneumonia, and it happened that all five were gay men. And it's in the report. And I didn't take much notice of it, and I don't think many others took much notice. In fact, there was very little attention to that initial report. But what happened quickly thereafter is other reports started coming from San Francisco, from New York. There was a series of cases of Kaposi sarcoma. And so what we now understand, 40 years ago tomorrow, we were seeing the first case of a patient with AIDS, the first reported case. And when you think from that point, it took us just over two years, almost two and a half years, before the virus was isolated. It took another whole year before we had diagnostic tests commercially available. It took another eight years before we had a first drug treatment. So if you just think about the long time frames that have been involved. But when you think about where we are with HIV, we have made enormous strides. And a lot of that is because of the incredible science that was undertaken, the discovery of antiretrovirals, and the push that came from the Durban conference in 2000 that made it clear that it was unacceptable that there would be individuals who can't access this treatment. And so we saw access to, to treatments becoming something that is addressed. We had the creation of the global fund, PEPFAR. Where are we today? Today, we are 
in the best position we have been in HIV in all of those 40 years. We have 27 and a half million people on treatment. We have still a way to go. And we have seen a slow and steady decline in cases of new infections. Worryingly, that decline in new cases has been slowing. We have seen, in fact, that our prevention efforts are not reaping the, the, the rewards we were expecting. We are still seeing just over one and a half million new infections every year. So we have a long way to go, a really long way. But I have to say that at this time, I am more optimistic about an HIV vaccine than I have ever been in the last 40 years. Are you prepared to put a time frame to that? <laughs> ah, you know, they say you should never you know, try to predict the future because it will come back and bite you. Uh, I have no idea. I would say that the two key elements are now becoming evident. And the one is that we have what we think are broadly neutralizing antibodies that can prevent HIV. And we have a new technology, thanks to COVID, in the form of messenger RNA, a whole new technology that will help us speed up the development of immunogens to try and create these broadly neutralizing antibodies. So, you know, I would be surprised that we, if we did not have a vaccine that was at least 50% or so efficacious within the next five years. That is extremely encouraging news. And thank you for bringing us that ray of hope on the eve of 40 years uh, since HIV AIDS was first noted. Thank you very much for your time. That is uh, Professor Salim Abdul Karim, Director of CAPRISA and member of the WHO Science Panel.